session, which is about growing your company, uh, we're creating companies of scale. Um, and so I'd like to invite up to the stage, um, Carol White, who's the president and CEO of Adipar, uh, but she was previously CEO and chairman of Simplicity, where she grew her company then to more than 3,000 business customers over three years. Uh, before that, she led worldwide corporate and business development at SolarWinds, top network ma management software company. And prior to joining SolarWinds, she served as managing director at Pico Ventures, a private equity firm with 1.8 billion under management. Um, from uh, 1993 to 2000, Karen was senior vice president at Oracle, where presumably she learned all these tricks from Larry Ellison. Um, Wendy Lee, the CEO of Get Satisfaction, uh, an angel investor, oh, she is also an angel investor, she's a strategic advisor and board member for a long, long list of startup companies. She serves on the board of Silicon Valley Social Venture Capital, SV2.org, and Corporate Visions, and has been recognized as the top 100 women of influence in Silicon Valley, and awarded the Watermarks Women Who Made Her Mark Award. Uh, prior to joining Get Satisfaction, Wendy was co-founder of On Target, a sales consulting firm acquired by Siebel Systems in 1999. John Innes, uh, CEO of the Amor Group here in Scotland. John has worked in the oil and gas and tech sectors for most of his life, having set up, established, and then sold Pragma, an oil industry IT specialist, to the S.O.R.D. Group. He, being then in the S.O.R.D. Group, um, he led the management buyout um, from its uh, French parents, I think, wasn't it? Um, and, uh, and it's now the Amor Group, which is a privately owned Scottish company. And he's grown it from 175 people to now over 600 people in the last four years. He's set ambitious growth targets to build his company to 250 million pound turnover during the next three years. So Amor Group is now Scotland's largest indigenous IT services company. It says here, a closet rock star, he dreams of his guitar and a return to the glory days of the 80s <laughs> when his band were part of the new romantic era. Okay, <laughs> whatever. So, John, you've got a couple of slides. Do you want to do that? Yeah, do that. Huh? Yeah. Thanks very much um, for the usual intro. Um, I'm delighted to see uh, most of you here today. Um, I'm, I'm, of course, not delighted to see employees from the Amore Group because you should be billable. <laughs> and this goes down as holiday. Um, <coughs> I've got a couple of slides um, which I can... Um, stumble through. It's, it's kind of, um, you've heard about how you raise cash. I, I want to tell you a wee bit about how we tried to raise um, cash. And uh, I'm just as bad as you, Heidi, in uh, raising cash, because we were about 60 meetings. Um, but now I know I'm average at raising cash, so I feel a lot better about that. We tried, uh, we tried to raise cash in 2008 to 2009, um, which is probably the worst conceivable time in our living memory that you could try to raise cash. But when I write my autobiography, it will be seen as a consummate piece of entrepreneurial timing. Um, it was really tough um, back then, and, and we're really talking, I guess, Eddie, about the private equity strand. So I was trying to raise about 30 million of cash. And we would go to London regularly because there just aren't that many private equity companies in Scotland who could have done the deal. Fact, perhaps there should be, but there isn't. Um, so it's good because I got my air miles shot up. Everybody that I met um, was very negative about our business. And uh, I thought we had a great business, but it was as yet unproven. Uh, you know, Ian's right, half of it came from the oil and gas, you know, background, pragma, IT services, annuity contracts, very robust, strong, enduring relationships. Half of it came from the, most of you'll know, the old real-time engineering in Pollock Shields in Glasgow. Um, dynamic, maybe. Uh, but software, lots of software, lots of solutions. I thought, bring them together. By design, great quality of the earnings, this is easy. I'll ask for the money on meeting one. Um, didn't, didn't turn out like that. No private equity company wanted to know me. They would see me walking down the street, they would lock the doors, they would bar the windows. Roll forward to 2013, and one of the things we'll have to do as a business in the next 18 months is scale our investor. Typical private equity hold, 
four to seven years, it's time for us to find bigger investors. This time around, I've got loads and loads of new busy mates in the private equity community. So I'm a very, very popular guy. Um, I'm invited to London now. People buy me lunches, they buy me drinks. It's brilliant. So the whole landscape has changed. And uh, we got our deal away eventually in 2000 and, sorry, 2009 we got it away, May 2009. Um, and it was a kind of mix of stuff. So yeah, there was kind of equity investment. Um, there was certainly was some senior debt in there from the Faisal Bank. Uh, there was also another sort of funding instrument called loan notes. I'm not gonna in, go into loan notes other than to say they're really, really expensive. So watch what you're doing with loan notes. So we kind of got a mix uh, and it's a, it's a, it's a kind of syndicate um, who back us. We've got private equity in there. We've got a bit of vendor rollover. So SWORD has kept an investment in us. And um, I think the, the, the minister's left now, but we've got some public money in here. We got backed by the government through the auspices of Scottish Enterprise. They put two million pounds into it. So that's kind of how we did our, our funding package. It was really, really difficult to get it away in 2009. Um, I remember we won Business Insider's MBO of the year. I was less pleased when I found that we were the only entrant that year. <laughs> Even then, I think it was first equal. Um, so anyway, that's the, that's the kind of story. Um, and I don't expect to, I really hope it's not so difficult this time around. Because one of the things, f from my perspective, I know I'm looking down the other end of the telescope from the previous speakers, it wasn't a lot of fun. I didn't enjoy it. I enjoyed very much leading a mower. I don't really enjoy making the same pitch, tuning the pitch to 50 people who are going to have a business relationship. But you know, private equity, they you know, ride you really hard for the results. So it's great to raise the money, but it comes with a conditionality. And I think Heidi talked about that. You know, We're in a numbers game here. And whilst in a public market, you manage by the quarter, I think, you know, Eddie, you're quite right there. Private equity, you manage by the month. You've got to be on your number or things can get really uncomfortable. So make sure you pick the right guys and phone up the CEO of one of their portfolio companies who's had a particularly rocky ride because everybody's a nice guy in the good times. So that would be my only bit of sort of advice. Moving away really from the cash and the raising cash, I'll just, I've, I've really, those of you who know me know I've really got nothing I can tell you. But what I can sort of describe is some of the stuff that we fell over and that we didn't see coming. And, and the, the first thing we fell over um, that sticks out for me was culture. So when we formed the Amore Group, we made sure that everybody got the same business card and it said Amore on it. But what I didn't recognize is the, the history of these companies. One had been built in Aberdeen on the northeast side of the country. One had been built in Glasgow on the southwest side of the country. And we were faced with the enormous challenge of making these two populations like one another. And that, those of you who have lived in either city, is almost an impossibility. <laughs> I am, in fact, an Aberdonian, as those of you who stood at a bar with me can attest to. Um, how many Aberdonians does it take to change a light bulb? Oh, it's not that dark. Um, <laughs> so they're, they're really tight, miserable people. I sort of belong to that set. And then there's the schism down here, the Glaswegians. And frankly, we just had no engagement. And one of the most uncomfortable investments that I've ever made was in culture. We got a, a business called Denison, who I think are based in San Francisco. I don't know why. I think you just need to put San Francisco in the head. Now, let's say San Francisco. And they specialize in taking a kind of, um, and now you remember this, Ian, you participated in this. They take an analysis of where the business is at. So how do we work together? How do we go to market? 
do we understand our mission? And we got an appalling result. So folks didn't know what Amor was there to do. We were kind of a bit, uh, a bit, a bit sort of opaque in how we went to market, how we tried to engage our customers. What was our USP? What's our value proposition? It was kind of all pretty poor, to be honest. But what came out of the back of that was a kind of a program of work to improve. So we worked on stuff. We worked on communications. We worked on one of the things that's really important for a, a technology worker is that he or she sees a structure through which he or she can progress in an organization. So if I can do this stuff, what's my next step? And making that visible and logical to our employees was really important. And so we had to take career development seriously, very seriously, probably for the first time. So we had lots of work streams created. And I can't remember who I was talking to this morning, but we invested, I mean, we're not a big company. You know, at that time we were maybe doing 30, million a turnover, something like that. Maybe now we do 60, but, but we invested a million quid, roughly. Thick end of a million quid in this stuff. And I didn't really know what culture was, remember. I thought it was maybe the ballet or the opera or something like that. But I can absolutely tell you, without a shadow of a doubt, we measured its impact in our business. And I think it put two or three points on our margin and gave us a much more uh, cohesive team within a more. So I think that's an investment that you should consider. It might appear esoteric, but I think it plays right through to your bottom line. Did for us. Um, so quickly going on to hiring, gets really bad, it's tough. You know, you, when you're small, you hire some pals, um, you do it in an unsystemic way. Now for us, um, it's really difficult. It does a talent war. It's not a HR process for us really, it's a marketing process. We go after potential recruits as we'd go after a potential customer. So keep that in mind. I think you really have to ramp up your hiring processes. Think about it in a different way. Um, and always be prepared. Higher up you are in the organization, start letting go. Let go quickly. Let people fall over. Put them in discomfort zones. Give them jobs to do that they can't do. Be prepared for that. Um, two more slides, I think. Processes. Um, most important thing we had to do was take a systemic approach to cash. So it had been a wee bit sporadic, a little bit, you know, it'll look after itself. This is now a team sport at Amor, I can tell you. This has regular, very deep stewardship. I still get on the phone to berate customers who don't pay us. Most corporate collapses, people run out of cash. So even though you get big and important and get invited to speak at stuff. Remember, cash, really important. Other processes, of course. Now we've got Salesforce. Thank you very much. It means all the salesmen can stay indoors and not see customers. Brilliant. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and speaking about, uh, speaking about customer, cu customers, I don't think that's a word. For example, customerization, I don't think it's a word. Um, but I have a limited vocabulary. Don't forget you've got customers. Um, you know I, know, I know as you get bigger, you know, you start having internal customers, uh, and that's really important, um, but ensure that your sales people are making the necessary number of calls every week. Remind them it's a contact sport. Um, don't forget about the external market. Don't get too inwardly focused on yourself. Um, and uh, I think that's it, is it? Must be. That's enough anyway, isn't it? <laughs> and have fun. <laughs>5 to 10, 10 and over, because they're very different, pre right? Pre-revenue, pre have we got pre-revenue? That's, that's fair too, because I think it's very different, you know, based on each of those segments. So mm -hmm. that, was our, that was our sophisticated polling <laughs> survey. Um, a couple of things just to kick off, and then we can go back and forth. One is, scale, uh, 
um, scaling can sound almost like a jargon, it's like a, it's jargon, like we've got to scale, like, no. I mean, to sc scaling is a strategy, it's not the objective. The objective is growth, and growth is contextualized around, am I a venture-backed, right, or a bootstrapped business, right, and I think that really matters, and I would just consider that, because it, it should be considered. But I think once you accept that scaling is a strategy, then you need to get under the hood of what that means, right, for your particular business and your particular industry with your particular customers. And I'll end at least this uh, session or this comment on this in this way. In our business, both the venture, the bootstrap business I ran, and now the venture, the venture back business I, I, I run, it was all scaling was always designed around the customer. Right? That was the centerpiece of everything we always did. Because without that, it's a little bit uh, self-absorbed and it's easy to lose your way. So your culture is, should be designed around who you're serving, right? Your employees are serving customers and I think that really helps you in scaling and the tactics of scaling. So that was, that's one thing I would say. And then I look at scaling relative to people, time, and money, right? Because that, to me, those are your anchor points. Beyond your customer being your centerpiece for scaling, scaling being a strategy for growth, then it's people, time, and money because you're going to be scaling based on different milestones, right, as you're, as you're going, growing your business. And I think keeping that in mind is very, very critical because scaling, I'll give you a specific example about get satisfaction. I started Get Satisfaction four and a half years ago. There were six people and a dog. Not very much money, brilliant founders, uh, angel funded, yay. Big idea. And there are certain parts of the business that scaled very quickly. Customer acquisition, because we're a freemium model. Very, very quick scaling, right? Uh, I noticed though that everything else didn't scale so well. <laughs> like the product, a little, little difficult to scale for the way, because of the way it was built, right? The conversion of free customers to paid customers, harder to scale. Why? Because of success around the customer using the application. So it was interesting how there was a lot of early scaling success around customer acquisition, low cost because we were highly SEO'd, but then when it came to the rest of the value chain, it was a little challenging. And I thought, okay, as a grown up, we need to step back and look at people time and money and see what part of this value chain we should focus on now as we get to the next round of funding. Remember, we're venture back. And it was very helpful for me. So at this stage and for us, I would say, remember, it's a strategy. It's not the objective. Uh, the second thing is, what is the design principle of scaling? And I would recommend for us, I've been in CRM for three decades, three, that's a long time. I've seen CRM come and go and keep going up and up, thanks to Benioff and Salesforce and those guys. <laughs> but at the end of the day, um, you know, that was the design principle of scaling. And then it's people, time, and money against your phases. Those are some of the things I would say, mm -hmm. right? I think about scale on so many dimensions, so I'll cover a few of them, and then I'll give you an example of one of the companies I was most recently involved in simplicity, because it kind of touches on them. Um, going back even one step further, I think because we're in the software business, I think in terms of architecture. Um, it is so common when you start a business or within your business you start a new product line, whether you're a cloud-based SaaS or whether you're on-premise software solutions, to start writing features and functions. And so many times you write a product requirements document that has a gorgeous list of features and functions and yet nowhere on it does it say must scale to support 10,000 concurrent businesses, a million concurrent users, must scale globally or any of these things. And it is so easy to write new features and functions comparatively with rewriting an architecture because that will kill, kill you in terms of timing. You have to take a step backward. So I would say that's the very first place uh, to think about. And um, coming into that, then let's talk about what the issue both folks have mentioned here in terms of team. And what I found is there are people that have proven track records of scaling in a particular business, that's great. There are people that you won't know if they will scale until they scale in very critical jobs in your organization early on or mid-range. And there are people, for example, in my current organization, I have two 
amazingly brilliant, talented people that I know will scale. They will scale within a year to two years. I need them to scale within a month to two months. So I'm going to have to figure out a way to keep them in the business, to keep them growing and happy while they learn to scale because the business is going to grow faster than they are. So assessing the talent around the table, including oneself, and figuring out where my risk points are. Um, and if you can de-risk any of the people issues by bringing in people with those proven track records or by recognizing that someone, in fact, has the potential but not fast enough, or that taking your bets that these guys I'm just going to bet are going to do it this time. But if it's all in any one bucket, you're probably in trouble from a people scale point of view. The third point I would make is when do you start scaling what? Mm -hmm. And what I find often is that we invest in the marketing and in the sales organization far in advance of when we should be spending those dollars. And what I like to do is have a prism looking at it from product market fit. And what I mean by product market fit is that when you look at what you have today and you look at your roadmap over the next six to 12 months, you can come in and win customers in your particular target market or one of your target markets um, without saying, I'm going to have that down the road, with being able to say differentiated things about your product that hit a critical, critical need of that customer base that doesn't have a 12-month sales cycle. And when you don't hear from the customers, hey, if only you built these three extra things on there, I'm in. Because if you're starting to invest in your sales and marketing in advance of having that product market fit, you're going to spend a lot of money fruitlessly, and you're going to lose good salespeople. Because good salespeople need their commissions. Good salespeople like to win. So I like to think of it as a business development opportunity at the onset, whether your model, by the way, is direct or indirect, whether you have a marketing velocity model or not. And finally, what I'd say that is, it kills a lot of companies as they go to scale is this issue of process. Because as entrepreneurs, we're allergic to process. Who wants to add all this garbage stuff to do now? I'm busy. Why do test and QA? Because I can get it out faster if I short circuit that. Um, why do the market testing and the A-B stuff? Because I can just push it out there. And with the cloud, the way it is today, and with so many development platforms as they are today, it's true. You may, in fact, push things out a heck of a lot faster than you ever could before. And you're thinking, I'm doing it faster, therefore I'm on the road to scale. So it is al also easy to make a high velocity of mistakes in the market that are going to cost you in terms of your scale. Um, so I like to say, sort of take that step back. Do I have my product market fit? And now that I've got that, um, scale my processes around it. What is my sales methodology? What is my market methodology, marketing methodology? And what are the couple of things I need to do in place? Are my development cycles every six months or every six weeks? What is my process? Whatever you define is going to be wrong from the gate as you grow your business. But if those are your key metrics and you know that this is my methodology, this is what I think my average sales price is going to be, this is going to be the, my average velocity of deals, you can at least put in certain systems, whether it's Salesforce or Marketo or, or whatever you're going to use for product management, whatever you're going to use for your product development, and make sure those systems will scale. Because once again, ripping those out uh, because they were cheap or free and having to replace them later. I'm currently replacing a CRM system that we've got 900 customers in. What a pain. It's going to set us back months. Always start with Salesforce. Always start. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, so those are, the, those are the things saying. that I would say have gotten me in the past. And I would, I would confess to making well, every mistake there, possible. Um, <laughs> you said you, you know some people who can scale in two years, but not in two months and so forth. And how do you know that? Because in my experience, you, know, you, you have to wait till people kind of almost break before you kind of you know, well, sorry, maybe I'm not a very good manager, but you know, um, how do you know that somebody can do it in two years instead of two well, months? Well, you know, there's a, there's a smart and fast um, yeah, yeah. balance okay. always. And so, um, you know, being in a startup, I'm just stunned by the capacity of folks, mm -hmm. you know, the smartness of folks. And then, then there are those that are just really, they're, they're good enough, but they're really fast. And you need a blend. Mm -hmm. Right, and it's the blend, and I think that is, again, being a venture-backed business, there, time is never your friend. Mm -hmm. So I'm always checking in mm -hmm. with the big ideas and how they're applied very, very quickly, and then some of them are not going to break, and how, how self-aware are they when they do break? Mm -hmm. Like, if they're going to argue me down on the ground about something that is friggin' broken, it's broken. 
okay, so you were smart and you came up with this good, great idea, but it's broken now, so we have to fix it, because I can't take that debate because yeah. time's not my friend. Yeah, yeah. So I like that self-awareness yes. between really big brains and moving fast, but we'll also stop and call the ball from time to time. That's how I see it, and it's really yeah. hard. And I, I think I would add to that, you know, I've been doing this nearly 30 years and I've been managing people for over 20. You get a muscle memory, you see pattern recognition, and you're not always right. But in my last company, I had two founders, and one of them, both of them extraordinary and brilliant. They had the right architecture, the right idea, the right market, all the really hard stuff they got right. One of them was a horrifying manager, micromanaging on top of his people, and the turnover was like this. Another one was also a horrible manager, and, but, but I could tell he had no capacity. So the first one was my CTO, who was also running product management and engineering. Often in the early days, you wear multiple hats. And the other at the time that I came in was CEO. And I recognized, and you know, this is public information, the CEO was not going to scale into that. He did not have the innate leadership qualities to go into that, whereas I recognized that the CTO did. We moved both of them from their roles, kept both of them in the company, but the CTO had to lose their employees, lose most of what they were doing, get rid of the engineering group, product management, and I said, I will develop you. And now, uh, three years later, he is running engineering. Uh, for the company after the acquisition, and he grew into it. And my recognition of him was as I was throwing this stuff at him, he wasn't arguing, and he was going, okay, got it, got it, got it, adjusting the behavior, velocity learning, and you, you, there was no, there were innate skills, and there was not this defensiveness um, to him, and three years, he, he grew as much as people normally would intend. I mean, that's a topic that you haven't really come on to yet, which is bringing people in. You know, you've got an entrepreneurial company, it's all the little family and so forth, and at some point or other you want, you know, your CEO's not up to it, you need a CEO, and you bring in somebody, and a really experienced CEO. How do you do that without changing the whole culture? You mentioned culture quite a bit. I mean, how do you do that without changing the, the fundamental culture of the business? Because it's a big, it's, you're doing a brain transplant, you know, if you're changing the CEO, but we all do it. Well, I, I mean, became the CEO in oh, that yeah, particular okay. company, and so I think, um, there are professional managers, CEOs, and there are entrepreneurial CEOs, and I, I like to think I have a hand in each because I've scaled businesses from up to a billion, and I've scaled businesses from zero to 10 and zero to 20. You know, there are different things that you do, but innately, um, I think that if you are in the software business of any kind, if you, in putting in management and processes and professional everything, forfeit the entrepreneurship within that and the agility within that organization, you have killed your companies growth potential. You might take it up to a certain point, but the really smart guys who are there to innovate and, and who are there to invent and who are there to iterate on it and whose joy in life is that will not stay if you've quashed that. So I think it's a very dainty and delicate balance between maintaining and letting your really smart um, technologists and, and entrepreneurs drive that part of the business while you knob and dial daily, weekly, monthly, just the right amount of process and, and, um, and you know, scalability metrics that you can put into the business. But it is a dangerous dance mm -hmm. to do every day sure. and, and you can misstep in either direction too much. So yeah. I think it's, it's really tough. Well, I, rec I, I recognize a lot of that. Um, mm -hmm. We have about 600 employees. Um, my learning, you know, value the outliers. So, what do I mean by that? I mean, I mean the risk takers. Um, I usually mean the terrible managers, <laughs> the crazies. Mm -hmm. Value them because they can move the dial mm -hmm. for you. The uh, health warning is they're capable of moving the dial in both directions. Mm -hmm. So you need to keep an eye on them. We have a number of them um, in the business. We might have a number of them in, in this room. Um, but we, we need them. We need a solid core of competence. Mm -hmm. we, we absolutely value that, but value and nurture um, those outliers. Yeah, I agree. The middle, you know, there's the middle of the bell curve. People, you know, there's a gravitational pull. At least this is a point of view I carry. There's a gravitational pull towards mediocre. There just is. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way of the world, and that's been proven over and over. So I, I too, look for uh, the, the top end of the bell curve, and you know the, the bottom end you're going to have to take action on, too. You're going to have to take an action on the first 
the, the people pulling that centerpiece because they're just going to be challenging in their own way. I think there's a lot of learning there. It's finding role and responsibility for those folks. Um, I will say relative to culture, I was a hired CEO and an investor. So I had three founders when I took over Get Satisfaction. And if there's one thing I would do, there are many things I'd do over again, but there's one that stands out relative to culture. I was so concerned about changing the culture because these were young social media mavens and they were like, when I used the term CRM, they were like, ooh, mm. like that's old and mm. don't talk about that here, right? And I kind of knew that the company would be part of that CRM industry yeah. overall, <laughs> just in terms of bringing value to customer company relationships. But if I did have anything to do over, it would be um, assess the culture, be more conscious with that, and yeah. move into it faster, yeah. rather than just allowing it to stay yeah. Right? Yeah. I should have yeah. broken it down yeah. a little bit faster, sure. truthfully, yeah. Yeah. because then by the time I wanted to to drive it head on, there was too much of a gap, because yeah. it was me over here and it was the rest yeah. of the guys, yeah. and that was hard. That's a bit that we haven't really talked about yet. too cautious, I think, in well, the beginning. Which is how do you move a culture forward? How do you develop right. a culture? What can take techniques do you use mm -hmm. to bring these 600 or you know 2,000 or whatever people with you? Mm. If, especially if they're in Aberdeen and Glasgow. <laughs> um, yeah, that was a challenge and <laughs> remains so. Um, I think, um, and I can't remember which speaker said it earlier, but it, it's to know what, you're, know what you're not good at. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I definitely, a bit like yourself, I was n this was not an area of specialism for me. I didn't know the answer to that question. The good news is um, we were smart enough to recognize that and smart enough to work with people who did get that and had worked with many organizations mm. to deliver okay. just okay. that business outcome. They are out there, mm. uh, and as I say, probably that looking back over the last five years, that probably remains um, for me the most um, important investment that we've made, so work with the right people. Mm. I think I would add that um, coming into a few startups that were, whether uh, when I came into Simplicity, there were, there were four, <laughs> right, I it's terrible. That were four people and the company that I just came into now has 85 people coming in. And there are parts about each of the cultures that I really loved and wanted to treasure and focus on keeping, mm -hmm. but other parts of the culture that I understood needed to shift in order to grow. And in each case approached it a little bit differently, but one of the commonalities would be to make sure, we work with a lot of engineers and engineers are very rational thinkers and almost overly so in some cases. Why am I doing this? Why am I doing that? What do you mean we have to do this? Isn't satisfying customers just giving them everything that they want? Mm -hmm. So what I started to do is communicate very carefully. Gosh, that's great that you are billing your customers quarterly in arrears, but gosh, the, I bet you, you know, changing the policy to annually in advance and not a single customer objected. Well, that's really great because mm. now <laughs> this is why we do that. And and on and on throughout the organization, just really making sure that it was communicated down the values, our next step which customers were most important, why we were driving a certain way or not, and so that as people went about their business making their decisions in a very agile way, explaining to them which way the train was running and what hill we were trying to take next. But also I said to each of them, I expect you to fail about a third of the time. Try to be the first to see it and raise your hand and tell us about it. And if you're not the first and someone's telling you, listen hard because we're all in this together and whatnot. And that changing of the culture really sort of helped us to get to a scale model. Questions from the floor? Yeah, here. Hello panel, uh, my name's Ewan Robertson. Um, I've heard quite a lot about um, experienced people who uh, can be brought in to help the founders really accelerate the growth of their companies. How do you attract these experienced people into those companies when quite often it's seen as quite a high risk proposition? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you want to take How that? Do <laughs> How do you attract them? How do you people? attract people? Who may have, have a, a fairly stable, you know, good life. They've got a nice company car. And a good life that. until you work for a startup. That's right, right. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Then it's screwed. So right, how do you persuade these people <laughs> to give up their stable, you know, secure yeah. life and, and join a startup? I mean, I would say it's, a, you know, there is a, there's an addiction to, let's just say it as it is, right? I, I mean, the bigger the problem, the more attracted I am, 
right? And the, and the attraction comes from not just fixing things, but building things. And I think it's a matter of you as a founder or whomever. I mean, I fell in love immediately when the founders described the vision, because it was so aligned with what I kind of generally understood and what I was fascinated by. But it was just the founder being very clear and straight up and telling me the story like he would a, a venture capitalist. And then, I mean, in that way, I have my money to, in, my time to invest. And in this case, I invested money too. But I just fell in love with the story. I, I think you have to get good at telling the story and you have to find your, you know, those people that are aligned with that field of work. And I think they told the story to 12 people. And, you know, there were three or four that were interested and I said, I really want this. And then I, I went after it. But then I was addicted. I remember that. Yeah, and I think Seven there are three degrees. things. If you've worked at a large company, as most of us have, as many of the people you might want to attract have, there are very particular frustrations in working for a larger organization mm -hmm. in terms of its losses of agility, a loss of control, a loss of so many things. Sell that, sell the vision, sell why this particular person is the right fit for you. Because the third piece is if you can look at an opportunity and convince this person they are the right hammer for this nail, and they are going to be the ones that can exponentially help to grow this business, that's very sexy. I want to, I want to go do that, and I want to do it in a rel relatively unhindered way versus working at a big multinational where I'm hindered, hindered at every step. And, and you know, there's, there's also the greed aspect. If I believe in the value of the stock and you're willing that's to right. be generous with stock with me, I will bet on that. I will forfeit cash for that, that stock. And, um, but, but be generous with me. Don't be stingy with, with that equity because that matters to me. If I'm going to take the risk, um, so should you. I, I get, you know, I get that. I mean, think, I think one of the things that um, I haven't done it, but we have a very talented marketing team at Amoa. They've made us appear much bigger <laughs> and grander <laughs> than we actually are. This can't go outside this room. But, um, so we've bigged it up from day one. I like that. And of course, that in itself acts as a, as, as a form of magnet. We say to people, look, the difference between working in a insert name of large systems integrator and us is that you can see your fingerprints in our annual report. That was your work. And we don't have all the bits in place, so guess what? Your opportunity is to come and create it. So we were very conscious about, um, and I hope considered about some of our exaggerated claims, but part of that was to attract people who wanted to make a difference and, and you know, see their fingerprints on the annual report. Mm -hmm. I guys, think yeah. an, another point has to do with, if I felt when I met, or I believed when I met the founders of Get Satisfaction, that they were gonna be control freaks about the business, I would have opted out, right? I could tell there was room there for another perspective, and so that, that mattered to me, right? That I could, have some real collaboration that I wouldn't have to be fighting them every way. And that creativity and that ability to let other people in really mattered to me. So I think that's where you have to gauge for you if you're, how much control, not just equity, but control that you're willing to, to, to allow people to have because you need to really take a look at that. Uh, that can get frustrating. Steve Jobs said to John Scully, do you want to spend the rest of your life selling sugar water? You know, or do you want to join the dream? Yeah. And that brings me to another question, which is, when you bring in big people from corporate world, it often doesn't work. Yes. So what, how do you assess that? How, how do you know the ones that might work? You know, they've been working for Oracle for eight, eight years or whatever, and they will work, and some ones won't. How do you make the, you know? Sometimes you're right, and sometimes you're wrong. <laughs> and, and where I'm often wrong is in sales guys. Ah, yeah. Um, and, and I've learned a little methodology in terms of interviewing for sales talent or major marketing talent, are you a doer? or Because mm -hmm. you get into the weeds of what somebody does and in a large company, okay, all your leads are handed to you, they've been polished off by a lead gen engine, they've been doing business in some other part of that business already, you have brand recognition. And so the way that that guy or gal has a set of skills is so different from the, here's a territory, good luck. Uh, we're putting our stuff in place now, we've got our first 30, 40 deals, we have no methodology written down. We, have, uh, we can train you in the demo and in the product, and other than that, let us know how it goes and help us divine that. So I usually look for someone who has tried, within their larger organization, has had to do something or been attracted to a problem that, where they really had to come with no net. 
come with no infrastructure, and they were comfortable working without infrastructure. Yeah. Just the general and soldier mentality, yeah. because in a startup, either bootstrapped or venture back. I mean, you're doing and leading, you're, and you're sometimes leading yourself. <laughs> I'm doing, I'm leading myself to the next project or milestone. I'm thinking beyond the project, I'm thinking about a deployment. <coughs> and uh, I think asking, you know, giving tests, uh, problem solving discussions, having those with people you're talking to is really, really important. I find it very difficult to hire someone straight out of a big company yeah. into a startup. I mean, I just think, again, they're, they just want too much infrastructure, like where's the receptionist? You know, who's gonna <laughs> order the lunch? Like, look at yourself, <laughs> get online and do it. I mean, it's really, really interesting. So the whole notion of how much process are they used to is really important. Because we want to have process to scale, we know that's required, but there's a timing yeah. and investment required to get there. And like some folks just don't like to get their hands dirty. Mm -hmm. It's just the way it is, they just don't. Sure. They'd much rather tell other people to do it, even, you know, instead of doing some of it themselves. So it's, it's, it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Yeah. yeah. Hello, my name is Aaron Arnott. As a lifelong maverick, I'm very glad you're here. We're no longer an endangered species. <laughs> uh, my question to the panel is, when you go for growth, is there such a thing as too much ambition? Too much ambition? Too much ambition or maybe too much capital to put be uh, behind <laughs> an ambition too soon? I don't know. I'm a very ambitious person. I don't think you can have too much ambition. But I do think you have to be a realist in terms of the size, velocity of your market and, and the velocity possible within your business. Mm -hmm. And this is where I see a lot of forward marketing. Marketing and sales, mm -hmm. forward spend, um, yeah. getting too far out ahead of your skis there will really start to burn the capital. Mm -hmm. And I think if you have a grandiose plan but you really haven't sorted out just how much you can reach those growth goals and if you overshoot on that, you're gonna overstaff on that and then you're gonna find that your, your capital structure suffers. So I think you can't be ambitious enough, but um, you, you can uh, fund investments within your business too ambitiously <laughs> um, to be careful. And, and it's a very delicate balance, I think. Yeah, I, 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 uh, you can't be too ambitious. <laughs> can you? And uh, I'm, uh, it's interesting, because I'm, I'm sharing the platform with two Americans and you know, that, that, that is that I, okay? That's fine. <laughs> it's fine. We're very welcome. And uh, I, you know, I always think oh, I'm ambitious. Then I meet other people, like I'm not ambitious. I'm Scottish. You know, it's, <laughs> I, I just think uh, I, I agree. I agree with you. Just, just be sensible the, the, on the calibration of the investment. Uh, I think that's important. We've been guilty of the sort of build it and they will come. I've seen that once or twice. And it's always costly to get out of that. Mm -hmm. um, when we're raising cash uh, in the market, we are careful not to be too esoteric. Give me some money and I'll go build something that's really great. I'd rather we've got the great stuff. I just need to hire more sales and execution in this geography. Mm -hmm. So we can't be, I, mean, I think what holds us back, frankly, as a nation is a complete lack of ambition. Um, on the, whether it's business, sport, or whatever. Um, we could learn a lot from our, our friends at, across the water, uh, but it is about a, a sort of calibrating it sensibly. I'm always, I'm from Mississippi, not from San Francisco, so let's just put that out there. But I'll, I will say that um, I have always been motivated by big, massive, interesting, complex things, right? I just have. and. That's what makes me a good entrepreneur and good CEO. So that it takes a lot of guts and ambition to do those things. Otherwise, it's just hard to get up because there's so many problems, right, every day. And so I, I think you have to be very ambitious, right? But that ambitious is holistic, right? It's not just about the CEO and their own brand or whatever. It's about the market opportunity. Be ambitious about the market opportunity. Then though, you have to be pragmatic relative to investing as you're pursuing that. And that's being time-based a little bit. And that is a difficult balance, because I want it all, <laughs> right? 
I just, I get up wanting it all and then I have to kind of come back off the ledge and realize that for this quarter or this six months, this is how much I can have. And the reason I can only have that much is because of growth against my burn, against you know all the things that I'm having to balance. But I gotta tell you, if I didn't think big and if I weren't ambitious, I would never be able to lead this company or any others that I've been involved with. You just, it's, it's a requirement, I think. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you one last nugget, and this is my first week of working at Oracle. I work for Larry Ellison directly, and we were talking about hiring plans and scaling the groups and whatnot. And we were talking about different people's attributes, and his philosophy was you need a couple of brilliant people, even if they're absolutely lazy, because if they come up with one amazing idea a year, they've more than paid for the, themselves, and you don't want them to have that idea if they're a competitor. Mm -hmm. Then you need a bunch of smart, really ambitious, execution-oriented people that just go, 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 go. And, and then you need sort of the worker bee, and, and then we describe this person who is remarkably ambitious and really hardworking, good at execution, but of average intelligence. And I'm like, yeah, but at least they're hardworking, they're ambitious. He said, get those people the hell out of your company. They will kill you because they have <laughs> mediocre ideas and they're horribly ambitious and they will execute like mad and they will ruin your company, so pay them to leave. And I thought, well, I always thought work ethic and ambition mm -hmm. were good things, but yeah. he, had a, he had a good yeah. point. Well, he's <laughs> done okay with that. <laughs> done okay with that hiring philosophy. That's great. Thanks very much. I think we've come to the end of the, uh, the session. So join me, help, please, in, in thanking Karen, Wendy, and John.